I don't think enough has been said about the wives of drug lords. I'm talking of the women who stood by dangerous drug barons through their most volatile moments, the ones who ran whole divisions of the drug trade, and the ones who were ruthless enough to overthrow and run the cartels themselves. Let's talk about the notorious wives of the most dangerous drug lords. Sandra Avila Beltra. Sandra was born into crime. In fact, she was a third-generation drug trafficker born in Baja, California, Mexico. Her family had serious ties to the ruthless Guadalajara cartel, so she continued with the family business. Sandra dated a lot of dangerous men in her youth and married a law enforcement officer as her first husband. This officer almost immediately switched to a life of crime after meeting Sandra. Was she the one who introduced him to crime? I don't know for certain, but what I know is that this husband eventually bit off more than he could chew and was killed in a shootout. Not too long after her loss, Sandra married another law enforcement agent who, just like her first husband, left the law and became a drug trafficker. He too was assassinated, stabbed in the heart at the height of the Mexican drug wars. As Sandra got older, she became craftier. Her crime career blossomed and it got to the point where she was smuggling tons of cocaine through a fleet of tuna boats that she owned. Money flowed in and Sandra spent that money like it was a natural resource. One example of her obscene spending was a gold pendant of King Tutankhamun that was studded with 83 rubies, 228 diamonds, and 189 sapphires. And the craziest part of all this was the fact that no one knew who she truly was. She told everyone that she made her wealth selling houses and clothes in Guadalajara. Eventually, the police caught up with her in 2002, when her teenage son was kidnapped by a rival cartel and she had to pay a $5 million ransom. They found out that Sandra, the humble saleswoman, actually owned more than 200 properties in Guadalajara. So, five years later, they arrested her. She was released in 2015 and now lives what many people call a not-too-quiet life in Guadalajara, Mexico. But Sandra Avila Beltran is a legend in the drug scene. At one point in her nefarious career, she was referred to as the Queen of the Pacific and even had a viral song written in her honor in 2004. And she even inspired the Mexican telenovela named Queen of the South. Emma Coronel Aispuro Joaquin Guzman matched Escobar's proficiency as a drug lord. Any fan of this channel knows that already. Guzman, also known as El Chapo, found revolutionary methods for the transportation of drugs into Europe and the US. He founded the Sinaloa cartel and became an urban legend. But behind every successful man is an equally successful woman. For El Chapo, this woman was Emma Coronel Aispuro. A year after they first met, Emma won a pageant show where she was crowned Miss Coffee and Guava in Canelas, Durango, Mexico. After the pageant, which many people felt that she won due to El Chapo, they declared openly that they would be getting married. They got married on the 3rd of July, 2007, which conveniently coincided with Emma's 18th birthday. They would later have a pair of twin girls named Maria and Emali. Unfortunately for her, El Chapo eventually got captured twice by the feds, and luckily for her, he also escaped twice. However, by his third capture, he was sent to a supermax prison in Florida, where even Clark Kent would have a hard time breaking out. And since the drug lord isn't from Krypton, he has been wallowing in jail ever since, serving multiple life sentences. So, the spotlight naturally shifted from the captured El Chapo to his bride, Emma with the authorities asking one very important question. What role did Emma play in her husband's Sinaloa cartel? Well, investigators would soon find out that she played a major role in helping her husband run his Sinaloa cartel empire. She was not only fully involved in trafficking drugs, she also provided useful information to the cartel. And to top it off, the second time her husband escaped from prison, she was the one who helped him. So, after building up a case against her, the feds arrested Emma. And four months later, she pleaded guilty to all the charges pressed against her by the feds. In November of the same year, Emma was sentenced to three years in prison. The reason for the lenient sentence was because of her guilty plea and because she showed remorse for being involved in her husband's illegal activities. She is currently serving her sentence at Federal Medical Center Carswell, where most people doubt that she will turn a new leaf before she is done with her time. Maria Victoria Hinao. One question I always had about Pablo Escobar was, how involved was his wife in his business? And I know I've talked about their relationship several times on this channel, but I don't think we've answered that question yet. The infamous Pablo Escobar had a home, and the person who kept it together was none other than his wife, Maria Victoria Hinao. However, Maria was in love and reportedly had no idea that Pablo would go on to become one of the most famous, most successful, and most feared drug barons that the world had ever seen. By every account, Pablo treated Maria like a queen, his queen. They had two children together, a boy named Juan Pablo Escobar and a girl, Manuela Escobar Henao. But there was a big problem. 
Maria was not the only woman in Escobar's life. Escobar had many flings with many women, and Maria had to endure every one of them, including a highly publicized affair with a controversial journalist known as Virginia Vallejo. However, while anyone would have left the man, Maria chose to stay with the drug lord to the very end. She was just 32 when Escobar was killed, and as the world celebrated his death, Maria grieved the only man she had ever loved. After Escobar, Maria chose not to remarry. Since rival cartels were more than willing to kill her and her children, and since the government wasn't too keen to protect them, she ran into hiding in Argentina, changing her surname from Escobar to Isabel Santos Caballero. Maria was, and still is, a quiet, private, and reserved woman, but that hasn't stopped people from wondering how involved she was in her husband's illegal business. If you asked her, she would tell you that she didn't know that her husband was a drug lord for the first few years of their marriage. However, in 1999, Maria and her son Juan Pablo were arrested for suspected money laundering. After their release, the press linked the arrest to Escobar's past crimes, and she immediately denied all allegations, insisting that she was just a wife to her husband and was never involved in any of his illegal businesses. As it stands, we might never know how involved Maria was in the Medellin cartel. Juliana Farai While Escobar ran Colombia, an American gangster named Frank Lucas ran the US. And unlike Maria, Frank's wife Juliana Farai was not shy about her husband's dealings. She was neck deep in it. Frank Lucas was an African-American that found a way to monopolize the drug market by cutting out middlemen and buying directly from the source in Asia. Subsequently, Frank Lucas controlled the sale of heroin all over the US, and his wife Juliana was right beside him, making sales of her own. Not much is known about Juliana's childhood, except that she was born into a very wealthy family in New Jersey in 1941. Her family would later relocate to Puerto Rico for some reason, and this is where she would spend the rest of her childhood. Having lacked nothing, Juliana grew to be a spoiled child and quickly became the black sheep of her family. Some years later, she would elope with Frank, whom she met at a house party. They fell in love, got married in the 60s, and had six children together. While Frank moved heroin around, Juliana's specialty was cocaine, and she got arrested several times for possessing and selling the drug. Even after her husband was busted and got to spend time in jail, Juliana continued peddling the white substance. When Frank was released in 1991 and became a key informant for the government, she didn't stop. After Frank got into a car accident that left him permanently restricted to his wheelchair, Juliana supported her husband and continued selling drugs. She even got arrested. On the 19th of May 2010, she was busted in a hotel in Puerto Rico for selling about 2 kilograms of cocaine. Two years later, she was sent to jail for the crime for five years. Eventually, Frank died on the 30th of May 2019, just two years after her release from prison. It was only after this that she stopped selling drugs. Clara Elena Laborin Clara Elena Laborin is an enigma. Not much is known about her background, but she's perfect at courting danger. Her husband was none other than Beltran Leva, the Mexican drug trafficker who broke away from El Chapo, formed his own cartel, and lived to tell the tale. But that's not all. He also started a bloody war against the Sinaloa cartel, because he felt that El Chapo had snitched on his brother, who got arrested. Beltran Leiva was, and still is, a very violent man. And this is the man Clara Laborin chose to be the love of her life. It's not difficult to understand why. She was a beauty queen when she met Beltran Leva, and according to everyone who knew them, he treated her like a literal queen. So, she went to the ends of the earth for him. She even ran the money laundering section of her husband's cartel, which was incredibly dangerous. So dangerous that in 2010, she was kidnapped by a rival cartel and photographed in captivity, blindfolded, bound with ropes, with guns pointed at her. 13 days later, her husband secured her release, and she returned to the section she was running like nothing happened. Four years later, Beltran Leva got arrested, and Clara became the head of the cartel. She plunged Mexico into one of the bloodiest wars it had ever seen. Even her husband's feud with El Chapo was nowhere near as violent, and it was all in a bid to take control. No one was spared, not even tourists. Eventually, Clara got arrested, and will definitely face a lengthy jail sentence, even though she claims today that she is no longer a part of the cartel. Griselda Blanco Griselda was born into poverty on the 15th of February 1943 in Santa Marta, Colombia. She was so poor that she turned to crime when she was just 11, helping to kidnap a boy and promptly killing the boy after his wealthy family refused to pay the ransom requested. By her teens, Griselda had married a small-time criminal and they would go on to have three children. But they divorced, and if the rumors are true, then Griselda also ordered his assassination. By the early 1970s, Griselda got married to a drug lord named Alberto Bravo, and through him, Griselda got into the cocaine trading scene. They made New York City their base, trafficking the unholy white substance into the United States. However, the feds were onto them, so Blanco and her husband fled to Colombia in 1975. 
However, things got ugly. In Colombia, Griselda confronted her husband when she found out that he'd been taking money from their business without telling her. The confrontation devolved into a shootout and Griselda murdered her husband, earning herself the nickname Black Widow. She remarried soon after and once again, she had her third husband killed. Recognizing her inability to keep a spouse alive, Griselda remained single and returned to the US by the late 70s. She moved to Miami where she quickly established herself as the godmother of cocaine. Then Griselda eliminated her competition by plunging the city of Miami into a period of violence that later became known as the Cocaine Cowboy Wars. She ordered several murders that were executed in daylight drive-by shootings by gunmen on bikes. With her criminal intelligence and absolute ruthlessness, Griselda grew insanely wealthy, netting at least $80 million per month. And Griselda enjoyed every bit of it, hosting hedonistic parties and buying million-dollar properties. However, all things good and bad come to an end. By 1984, Blanco had to leave Miami for California because everyone was after her. By 1985, she was arrested and found guilty of multiple drug charges. She received a maximum sentence of 15 years, and by 2004, Griselda was released and deported to Colombia, where she retired from her life of crime. But it was too late. In 2012, karma came knocking when she got killed by a gunman on a bike as she left a butcher shop in Medellin, Colombia.